Part One, Chapter One, Section Three, Part Three of Capital. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Carl Manchester, 2007. Capital by Karl Marx. Part One, Chapter One, Section Three, Part Three. C. The general form of value. One coat, ten pounds of tea, forty pounds of coffee, one quarter of corn, two ounces of gold, half a ton of iron, X commodity A, etc. Equal ten yards of linen. 1. The altered character of the form of value. All commodities now express their value. 1. In an elementary form, because in a single commodity. 2. With unity, because in one and the same commodity. The form of value is elementary, and the same for all, therefore general. The forms A and B were fit only to express the value of a commodity as something distinct from its use value or material form. The first form, A, furnishes such questions as the following. One coat equals twenty yards of linen. Ten pounds of tea equals half a ton of iron. The value of the coat is equated to linen and that of tea to iron. But to be equated to linen and again to iron is to be as different as are linen and iron. This form, it is plain, occurs practically only in the first beginning when the products of labour are converted into commodities by accidental and occasional exchanges. The second form, B, distinguishes in a more adequate manner than the first the value of a commodity from its use value. For the value of the coat is there placed in contrast under all possible shapes with the bodily form of the coat. It is equated to linen, to iron, to tea, in short, to everything else, only not to itself, the coat. On the other hand, any general expression of value common to all is directly excluded, for in the equation of value of each commodity, all other commodities now appear only under the form of equivalence. The expanded form of value comes into actual existence for the first time, so soon as a particular product of labour, such as cattle, is no longer exceptionally, but habitually, exchanged for various other commodities. The third and lastly developed form expresses the values of the whole world of commodities in terms of a single commodity set apart for the purpose, namely the linen, and thus represents to us their values by means of their equality with linen. The value of every commodity is now, by being equated to linen, not only different from its own use value, but from all other use values generally, and is, by that very fact, expressed as that which is common to all commodities. By this form, commodities are, for the first time, effectively brought into relation with one another as values, or made to appear as exchange values. The two earlier forms either express the value of each commodity in terms of a single commodity of a different kind, or in a series of many such commodities. In both cases it is, so to say, the special business of each single commodity to find an expression for its value, and this it does without the help of the others. These others, with respect to the former, play the passive parts of equivalence. The general form of value C results from the joint action of the whole world of commodities, and from that alone. A commodity can acquire a general expression of its value only by all other commodities, simultaneously with it, expressing their values in the same equivalent, and every new commodity must follow suit. It thus becomes evident that since the existence of commodities as values is purely social, this social existence can be expressed by the totality of their social relations alone, and consequently that the form of their value must be a socially recognised form. All commodities being equated to linen now appear not only as qualitatively equal as values generally, but also as values whose magnitudes are capable of comparison. By expressing the magnitudes of their value in one and the same material, the linen, 
Those magnitudes are also compared with each other. For instance, 10 pounds of tea equals 20 yards of linen, and 40 pounds of coffee equals 20 yards of linen. Therefore, 10 pounds of tea equals 40 pounds of coffee. In other words, there is contained in one pound of coffee only one-fourth as much substance of value, labour, as is contained in one pound of tea. The general form of relative value, embracing the whole world of commodities, converts the single commodity that is excluded from the rest, and made to play the part of equivalent, here the linen, into the universal equivalent. The bodily form of the linen is now the form assumed in common by the values of all commodities. It therefore becomes directly exchangeable with all and every of them. The substance linen becomes the visible incarnation, the social chrysalis state of every kind of human labour. Weaving, which is the labour of certain private individuals producing a particular article, linen, acquires in consequence a social character, the character of equality with all other kinds of labour. The innumerable equations of which the general form of value is composed equate in turn the labour embodied in the linen to that embodied in every other commodity, and they thus convert weaving into the general form of manifestation of undifferentiated human labour. In this manner, the labour realised in the values of commodities is presented not only under its negative aspect, under which abstraction is made from every concrete form and useful property of actual work, but its own positive nature is made to reveal itself expressly. The general value form is the reduction of all kinds of actual labour to their common character of being human labour generally of being the expenditure of human labour power. The general value form, which represents all products of labour as mere congelations of undifferentiated human labour, shows by its very structure that it is the social resume of the world of commodities. That form, consequently, makes it indisputably evident that in the world of commodities the character possessed by all labour of being human labour constitutes its specific social character. 2. The interdependent development of the relative form of value and of the equivalent form. The degree of development of the relative form of value corresponds to that of the equivalent form. But we must bear in mind that the development of the latter is only the expression and result of the development of the former. The primary or isolated relative form of value of one commodity converts some other commodity into an isolated equivalent. The expanded form of relative value, which is the expression of the value of one commodity in terms of all other commodities, endows those other commodities with the character of particular equivalents differing in kind. And lastly, a particular kind of commodity acquires the character of universal equivalent because all other commodities make it the material in which they uniformly express their value. The antagonism between the relative form of value and the equivalent form, the two poles of the value form, is developed concurrently with that form itself. The first form, 20 yards of linen equals one coat, already contains this antagonism, without as yet fixing it. According as we read this equation forwards or backwards, the parts played by the linen and the coat are different. In the one case, the relative value of the linen is expressed in the coat. In the other case, the relative value of the coat is expressed in the linen. In this first form of value, therefore, it is difficult to grasp the polar contrast. Form B shows that only one single commodity at a time can completely expand its relative value, and that it acquires this expanded form only because and in so far as all other commodities are, with respect to it, equivalents. Here we cannot reverse the equation, as we can the equation 20 yards of linen equals one coat, without altering its general character, and converting it from the expanded form of value into the general form of value. Finally, the form C gives to the world of commodities a general social relative form of value, because, and in so far as, Thereby, all commodities, with the exception of one, are excluded from the equivalent form. A single commodity, the linen, 
appears, therefore, to have acquired the character of direct exchangeability with every other commodity because, and in so far as, this character is denied to every other commodity. Footnote. It is by no means self-evident that this character of direct and universal exchangeability is, so to speak, a polar one, and as intimately connected with its opposite pole, the absence of direct exchangeability, as the positive pole of the magnet is with its negative counterpart. It may therefore be imagined that all commodities can simultaneously have this character impressed upon them, just as it can be imagined that all Catholics can be popes together. It is, of course, highly desirable in the eyes of the petit bourgeois, for whom the production of commodities is the neck plus ultra of human freedom and individual independence, that the inconveniences resulting from this character of commodities not being directly exchangeable should be removed. Proudhon's socialism is a working out of this philistine utopia, a form of socialism which, as I have elsewhere shown, does not possess even the merit of originality. Long before his time, the task was attempted with much better success by Gray, Bray, and others. But, for all that, Wisdom of this kind flourishes even now in certain circles under the name of science. Never has any school played more tricks with the word science than that of Proudhon, for wo begriffe fehlen, das stellt zur rechten Zeit ein Wort sich ein. Where thoughts are absent, words are brought in as convenient replacements. Goethe's Faust, see Proudhon's Philosophy of Poverty. End of footnote. The commodity that figures as universal equivalent is, on the other hand, excluded from the relative value form. If the linen or any other commodity serving as universal equivalent were at the same time to share in the relative form of value, it would have to serve as its own equivalent. We should then have 20 yards of linen equals 20 yards of linen. This tautology expresses neither value nor magnitude of value. In order to express the relative value of the universal equivalent, we must rather reverse the form C. This equivalent has no relative form of value in common with other commodities, but its value is relatively expressed by a never-ending series of other commodities. Thus, the expanded form of value, or form B, now shows itself as the specific form of relative value for the equivalent commodity. 3. Transition from the general form of value to the money form. The universal equivalent form is a form of value in general. It can, therefore, be assumed by any commodity. On the other hand, if a commodity be found to have assumed the universal equivalent form, form C, it is only because, and in so far as, it has been excluded from the rest of all other commodities as their equivalent, and that by their own act and from the moment that this exclusion becomes finally restricted to one particular commodity, from that moment only, the general form of relative value of the world of commodities obtains real consistence and general social validity. The particular commodity, with whose bodily form the equivalent form is thus socially identified, now becomes the money commodity, or serves as money. It becomes the special social function of that commodity, and consequently its social monopoly, to play within the world of commodities the part of the universal equivalent. Amongst the commodities which, in form B, figure as particular equivalents of the linen, and in form C, express in common their relative values in linen, this foremost place has been attained by one in particular, namely gold. If, then, in form C, we replace the linen by gold, we get D, the money form. 20 yards of linen, 1 coat, 10 pounds of tea, 40 pounds of coffee, 1 quarter of corn, 2 ounces of gold, half a ton of iron, X of commodity A, equals 2 ounces of gold. In passing from form A to form B, and from the latter to form C, the changes are fundamental. On the other hand, there is no difference between forms C and D, except that, in the latter, gold has assumed the equivalent form in the place of linen. Gold is in form D what linen was in form C, 
the universal equivalent. The progress consists in this alone, that the character of direct and universal exchangeability, in other words, that the universal equivalent form, has now, by social custom, become finally identified with the substance gold. Gold is now money with reference to all other commodities, only because it was previously, with reference to them, a simple commodity. Like all other commodities, it was also capable of serving as an equivalent, either as a simple equivalent in isolated exchanges, or as a particular equivalent by the side of others. Gradually, it became to serve, within varying limits, as universal equivalent. So soon as it monopolizes this position in the expression of value for the world of commodities, it becomes the money commodity, and then, and not till then, does form D become distinct from form C, and the general form of value becomes changed into the money form. The elementary expression of the relative value of a single commodity such as linen, in terms of the commodity such as gold that plays the part of money, is the price form of that commodity. The price form of linen is therefore 20 yards of linen equals 2 ounces of gold, or if 2 ounces of gold when coined are 2 pounds, 20 yards of linen equals 2 pounds. The difficulty in forming a concept of the money form consists in clearly comprehending the universal equivalent form, and as a necessary corollary, the general form of value, form C. The latter is deducible from form B, the expanded form of value, the essential component element of which we saw is form A, 20 yards of linen equals one coat, or X of commodity A equals Y of commodity B. The simple commodity form is therefore the germ of the money form. End of part one, chapter one, section three, part three.